What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another fabulous, almighty Grand Slam episode of Get the Cash Flow Game with K and K. I just sometimes that, like to say that was, things. That was a good intro. Yeah, sometimes I like to say it. things because Crystal, like, if you guys are watching the video, you'll know. But there's probably not a day that goes by that Crystal doesn't give me some type of dirty look or what did you say or okay, you're embarrassing us again, or whatever. Um, I cannot believe, you can't even pronounce words. I'm like, you really said that? Like, that's how you spell the word? Oh my well, God. let's just get this out there on the table. You missed your calling. You should be a reality show person. You would definitely- I'm here, I'm here. Yeah. Hello, come read. Actually, they have reached out, but you know, you gotta do better. I don't the know- The ratings would skyrocket. Yeah, I don't know sure. for what, but you know, put me on a show, let's see what happens. They, I might not even last, who knows. So who do we have on today? So we have on Jason Lee. Jason Lee is a broker here in uh, San Diego, California. That's San Diego, California, where we live. And we shoot this podcast because it's the best place on this planet. We're all biased here. But anyways, Jason, we wanted to bring him on. We do. We work with Jason. Um, we actually met Jason because he found us on our podcast, came in. And what I love about Jason is for anybody in life that's listening is, is when somebody comes in your life and they say, hey, how do I do these couple things? And I say, oh, just go do this. And they go, cool, I did them. I started a podcast. I hired a VA. I, whatever, I'm doing marketing. Like this guy's young, he's crushing it, um, but his energy is really good. But look, just like Chris and I just said, many people, what do you know, came from very humble beginnings, Nothing handed to him. You're gonna hear about that. It's actually a really, really cool story. You're gonna hear about a story, um, but you know, Jason's gone out there and made a name for himself. Came in and just kicked ass. Worked really hard. Um, kind of get no give a f attitude because there's nothing to turn back to. There's no mom and dad. There's no money tree. There's no nothing. So you got to go out and make it work. So honestly, like, kudos to Jason. So I want to have him on to learn more about that. Yep, Jason, uh, we were actually on his podcast as well, but um, he's just like a really kind of up and coming broker in San Diego. Even all of the top brokers are hearing his name around a lot. He's doing a ton of deals. He's working with a lot of the big apartment owners. and so Commercial broker guys, sorry. Yeah, I didn't. apartments. Yeah. So he um, is just really somebody that you want to know, somebody that you need to know, and somebody that you need to watch because he is succeeding for a reason. And uh, I think a big reason is uh, exactly what Kenny said. You know, somebody if somebody tells Jason what they're having success with, he he goes back and he thinks about it. And if he needs to implement it, he doesn't say, you know, I'll do it next week. Go, I'll get around to it when I have time. He implements it. He right gets away. shit done. Yeah, he gets shit done. If you're young, um, you should go be buying Jason lunch or dinner. And learning from them seriously because if you're not kicking ass you should get around people that are kicking ass because that will improve your life especially if you're trying to in the monetary the money part so without further ado ladies and gentlemen here's jason Lee. jason thanks for coming in today having you on thanks for your time glad we're in we're actually in the studio here so it's nice it's been a while yeah jason's local so we don't have to shoot a zoom from across the country <laughs> it's a pleasure thanks for having me seriously yeah. Great so, to be here. So, Jay, we want to have you on. Obviously, we work with each other. Um, Jason is a commercial broker, so he finds people primarily that want to buy, I would say, five plus units. He also helps one to four, but investment properties. So, investment properties in general, yeah. really. And uh, I want to have him on today because I think a lot of people just have this misconception that, well, I'm going to wait till I'm like older in life to get my shit together or <laughs> figure out how to buy properties to become successful. But obviously, Jay, you've had some like some good success right off the bat. Number one. So congrats. That's thank you. That's awesome. And number two, I just want to kind of jump in. Like, can you talk about like why in the world did you pick real estate and why commercial and like what, how are you here today? You know? I mean, it's a great question. Um, first off, I think I'm just very lucky to be here. Um, I think Everything happens for a reason. And um, I was just searching for some way to make it, you know? Um, I had a big why. Um, coming into college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I thought I was gonna be in the medical field. I wanna be a doctor, because doctors make good money. But you can't get a job until you're like 40, 35. So I was like, my entire 20s are gonna be gone. I'm gonna be 33 when I start my first paycheck, right? 
Um, so my junior year, I had like a, <clears throat> I had like a, a huge like mindset, a mindset shift. And, um, I started networking with everyone I could met a ton of new people and I fell into the lap of, um, the owner of South coast commercial, Brian Nelson. And, um, from there I started interning there. I knew nothing about real estate. I didn't know what an escrow was. I didn't know what title was. I knew nothing about real estate, but I just listened. I, um, learned a lot every single day and then, um, just put the time in and, um, here we are today. Nice. So it just took a lot of hours of just learning, doing the practice, you know, staying late and um, meeting new people. Yeah, I think it's 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 crazy because I think people look at you and when you're good at what you do, it looks easy. But I think brokerage is anything but easy because it's a lot of no's and a lot of figuring it out and a lot of people who've been in it a lot longer than you. So it's like and a lot of personalities. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty amazing <laughs> that you've had the amount of success that you've had in such a short amount of time. Like when you think about that, is, is there any like couple things that you feel like really helped you to be successful? Um, I just think it all starts from like what your why is. I think, um, if you don't have a reason to put the time in, you're not going to, right? Um, I, you know, come from a pretty lower to middle class family. Um, you know, my dad is a, is a security guard. Uh, my mom, um, she didn't work for a while. She tried starting her own, her own business, like a like a juice store. Uh, didn't work out. Um, had a pretty tough childhood with you know financials. So I knew what it was like to be poor. Um, and I wanted everything but that in my life. I wanted to make sure that my kids were going to have, you know, all they need to, you know, live, go to a good school, have the right education, never worry about money. So um, I just think I knew that coming into adulthood. Like, I think by the time I was 20, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to put all the time into working right now. And I know that real estate's a proven vehicle for meeting all these crazy rich people. Like, um, I met with, with a billionaire investor. He owns about 5,000 units solo here. Um, my junior year of college, you guys know who he is. Yeah. Um, and after I met with him, like my entire life changed, I feel like, because he's just an average guy. Like he's not anything special. He just knew how to make money in real estate. Um, and he got started a little later too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was a musician until he was 30. Crazier. Um, it's insane. I mean, he bought his first fourplex in Hillcrest and kept buying and exchanging and brokered some de brokered some deals for people. Excuse me. And uh, from there, he just built some capital and kept doing it and never stopped. So, I mean, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just brokering to buy more investments. Um, that's my. That's all I do. <laughs> that's my hobby, passion, and career. So, yeah, um, that's yeah. all. I mean, you know, I think uh, what's awesome is is that. Um, I mean, I asked you this because, you know, when I was younger, I probably had a lot of motivation. My probably uh, downsize is I probably should have met with, you know, 100 mentor people, like you just said. And I, I surrounded myself probably with just like people that I thought were there, but they're just, at, when I look back, like, they're just average guys, right? They just didn't even understand anything. They're just, they're there to make the money, but they weren't building wealth, right? So what do you think, like, Somebody that's your age, you're what, 20? 20, 24. 24. About to be 25, crazy. yeah. yeah he, quarter century old. Um, what do you think the disconnect is like people at your age? Why are, nor, why are more people just not hungry? Do you think it's because they're like, I'll just put it off, I'll wait till later? Or? I mean, <clears throat> from my friends and from um, who I know from college and uh, people that are my age, I just think they, what you said, they want to wait till you know, I'll, I'll wait till I'm 30 to, you know, make that jump or I'll wait till I'm, you know, in my, you know, later twenties to start really grinding up right now. I just want to live and party and live life and just, you know, kind of cruise. Um, that's what I've seen majority of people say, uh, to me when like, cause people ask me why I work so hard. They're like, why are you like, like, why do you never come out with us? Like, why are you always working? Like, why do you never, um, like come have a drink or come out to PB I'm like, I just have other things to do. I'm just busy doing other stuff. I'm building, building my website. I'm building my podcast. I'm working on my marketing strategies. It's just a different mindset. And I feel like the few people I met that are my age who are doing big things are very similar. Like they have um, a destination where they want to go. And, um, 
and that's just their number one priority. I think life just comes down to values. I think um, if your number one value is, you know, being successful, making money, and you know, taking care of your family, then the other stuff doesn't matter. So, yeah, I think that's the hard thing is that we all think we have so much time, uh, and even me, I wish that I had started investing sooner. But because in your 20s, you think I have all this time and you're right, you have so much time. So it's the best time to build something if you want. And then in your 30s, you might be settling down, starting a family, and then you have kids and then you really understand how much time you had in your 20s, which is kind of where we're at now. And you're like, oh my gosh, I, I felt like we worked a lot, but I'm like, I should have done even more than I did. And I think that's just the difference is that you know, I think we all put our emphasis in different places. So if, if it's socializing or if it's building something that you can leave to your family or even, you know, help take care of your parents, which is a really cool thing to be able to do too. So um, can you kind of like, like what are your goals in terms of like, cash flow or how many properties you want to own or any of that? What, what is your goal? That's a great question. Um, I think my goal is just to make a big difference in the world some way. I think real estate is the vehicle to make money. Um, it's nothing much more than that. I think, you know, in the long run, I want to, you know, donate a ton of money to charities I care about. I want to, um, you know, make sure my family's taken care of. And I just want to make a huge positive impact in some way on the world, whether it's, you know, um, helping out with world hunger or um, the homelessness, the homeless problem in San Diego is a huge thing that can be solved with, you know, some tweaks and planning, which I think is a huge deal. Um, things like that. I mean, I, I just feel like real estate is a way just to build passive income and to do things you want to do. And that's what I'm trying to do right now, because, you know, I'm only, like you said, I'm only 24, 25. If I keep buying real estate for the next decade, in 10 years, I probably won't have to work if I don't want to. So from that, I can, you know, build what I want, um, you know, maybe start a nonprofit, kind of just do my own thing to where I can make a big impact in some way. I love that you're thinking so big. So I think most of us just, uh, you know, first you're like, I need to pay my bills, you know, like, so yeah. that could be someone's goal. <laughs> like, I just need to like get a job to pay my bills. But then I think we get stuck in that too. A lot of times is that you have that one goal and then it's really hard to keep going with your goals. So to say something like starting a nonprofit or, you know, helping to solve, you know, the homeless problems or world hunger, all those things are such really big goals. But I feel like when you have those goals, that's what keeps you going every day is that you have this, you know, mountain you have to climb and you, you can see it. You, that's exactly, that's your goal. That's your kind of roadmap to get there. So that's awesome. Exactly. And you have to love what you do, right? Because you can't get there if you hate your life every day. So if you're, you know, whether you're in real estate, in the tech world, in finance, whatever it is, got to love what you do so you can get on the top of the mountain to where you want to go. Because if you don't love what you do, it's going to be very tough to, you know, to move mountains. So that's what I realized as well, because I actually first tried starting a digital marketing business that I absolutely hated. I had like five clients in college when I was a senior that I ran Facebook ads for. And I was like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Like, I'm going to, you know, make a ton of money this way because I know it works. But I was hating my life running ads every day. So um, I'm just really glad I fell into real estate. That's that's cool. I think, yeah. though, it's a testament to how you're willing to try things. And it's okay, like, if it doesn't work out. I, I mean, I wouldn't even call it failing. It's just like, hey, this sounds, seems great. But as you know, like, in everything, there's might be a piece of it that you love. But if you hate too many other things, about it, then yeah. that's not your calling. Uh, but it's probably also helped you, I think, with your business, the social media marketing background that you had with your podcast and your social media and your website and all those things. Has that been a good foundation for you? Yeah, it has. Um, I've always found marketing really fascinating, like how to like lure in a potential client through, you know, certain copywriting, certain pictures, videos, Something that like triggers emotion. I've always been fascinated by human psychology. So I studied it a lot like um, the past, the last three or four years. Um, and I've just kind of just put it into my business of real estate. And I feel like a lot of people in my world don't do any of this stuff. Um, like I'm probably the only guy with a podcast in commercial real estate in San Diego. Yep. Um, 
And you're probably the only lenders with a podcast in San Diego, honestly. I don't know anyone else who does it. Definitely commercial lender for you, Crystal. But um, I think it's just given me an edge and a different spectrum to my business that um, a lot of people don't try to do. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, somebody once said to me, uh, yeah, but Kenny, I understand what you're doing, but all the clients, they're all 60, 70, and 80, and, and they and they don't go on there. And I said, cool, but what about their kids? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, the funny part is, though, some of our <laughs> 60, 70, 80-year-old no, no, no. clients but do I listen. I thought they go, <laughs> they do go on there, number one, because they're all on there, especially when COVID hit. More people went online, like everything. The guy that didn't use Amazon, always wanted to go to the store. He didn't use Amazon once. I'm not going to go to the store anymore, right? It's like, but their kids are. And their kids are going to inherit these properties. They're either going to piss the money away, build a portfolio or something, but you can get to them. If you can get to the key, sometimes you're getting to the son. The son's like, hey, dad, have you ever checked this guy out? Like Jason, whoever, you know, I mean, so I think there is a, there's a psychology behind, like you said, you just test, 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 and you're checking out. Um, I posted something today. I wanted to read this to you because I want to see. It's funny because if I read this to you probably before you got in real estate, you'd be like, what are you talking about? Because I kind of want to transition the conversation to like, you know, you started buying real estate yourself and then you kind of said your why, but then there's, I think when you start buying real estate, I think there's also different phases of real estate because you buy and you're like, okay, I'm buying. Then you start buying for a different reason, right? And a lot of people like you meet like the first year down, you're like, why do they keep buying? And a lot of it's for tax reasons or whatever. So I posted this, I said, wealthy people take earned income from a talent and buy assets that pay them. Those assets that pay them give them cash flow and also help reduce taxes. That asset goes up in value over time. Cash flow increases with rents rising. And then you can go borrow tax free from that asset where the payments are covered by cash flow. That's the real game. Like you came on here, you're triggering me. You're like, I just wanted to, you basically said, I want to use commercial real estate as a talent. I can make money to buy real estate. And it's like, this game is very simple. Like it was funny because I was saying it's like, you're meeting people and we had a person in here too. And it's like the guy owned $300 million of real estate and they're just average Joe's. They didn't have like, to, you see them walking down the street. And they, you would the, never these know. people yeah. didn't go get doctors or go to Harvard. They literally just figured out a path and they literally beat the shit out of it. Some of them like beat it to where you're like, how did you even get there? Cause I could beat it. And I still don't understand how you got there that fast. Right. So with that being said, like, what is your, when you are dealing with clients or somebody's looking to buy their first piece of real estate or investment property, like what is that conversation like with you with them? I mean, there's always a reason why they're buying, right? Um, it's sometimes a doctor who's making half a million a year and they're getting their, their uh, taxes take half their income, right? So tax is a huge reason why people buy real estate. I think that's like half the reason why people come to me and ask, you know, do you have any deals? Like, what are you doing? Um, what's going on in the market? I'm looking to buy a property. Uh, tax is huge. Um, and then cash flow is another big one. I think cash flow is massive. I mean, who doesn't want cash flow, right? Like, how can you Dude, not, how can you not like cash that's flow? That's the ultimate. That's like, it. That's it. Like making money while you sleep is the absolute best concept I've ever heard in my life. Like it's literally like a slot machine, just feeding you money every month. It's just crazy that you can buy a piece of property and tenants are paying down your mortgage. And after your mortgage and your expenses are paid, the rest is cash flow in your pocket. So I think those two reasons are why 95% of my clients buy. Some just want to park their money because they have so much money and they want to just put it into like a trophy asset that gives them appreciation and where the management's super easy. All the tenants are, you know, good tenants. Um, but I think those three reasons are, are the main three reasons why anyone buys real estate. So it's why I buy real estate. I mean, yeah. a mix of those three. So, yeah, I think um, somebody that might just really want to get in, like, maybe doesn't even really have the money. They're trying to get in. They're trying to, maybe they're young pushing it. I think they haven't even understood the tax benefits. They don't even, they're not even there yeah, they're yet. They're the more system. like, yeah. I just know this rich guy that owns much real estate. I'm like, apparently, I, I mean, I need to get into that. And they don't, they're like, they know the cash flow. Then when I think that's always tell people like your first deal is like your conversation. Everybody's like, oh, I just want to get $5,000 a month cash flow and I'm done. I'm like, no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I promise you, when you even get to 5,000, when you're there, your conversation you're talking to yourself is going to completely change, right? That's why you ask Jason, it's like, he'll get somewhere, regardless of the help and stuff, you just start thinking completely different. It's just like when you sit across the table and somebody's like, this guy's in here, it's like, 
why don't you just go live your life and just, why do you have to, why do you, well, you're 70 something years old. This guy was in here. What, what do you, I didn't ask him like, why is this guy buying? I already, I don't even ask him. I know why it's fun. It's a game. It's taxes. My CPA said, go buy $30 million of real estate. Why? Cause you're going to get slaughtered. Okay. <laughs> like you have the money, go do it. If you don't want to, then this is your tax bill. You know, I mean, it's literally that simple. I mean, I think the wealthy buy real estate for taxes, you know? I don't think this is, I'm just being here. It's like, I think this is such a simple concept, but everybody overthinks it, you know? It's like you work, you save your money, you get a good team that consists of a broker, a lender, insurance, maybe manage and all that, and you go buy real estate. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, we talk about it so much, but there's different strategies to investing in real estate, and I think it's very dependent upon where you're at in your life, and I would say that we're in a growth pattern the three of us sitting here at the table. Yeah. So what is kind of your strategy right now for buying real estate and growing your portfolio? So I focus strictly on multifamily because it's what I know. It's what I study every single day. Um, I don't look outside of San Diego <clears throat> and my partner and I, you know, we've bought eight properties this year and um, every single property has been um, four to eight units. Um, sorry, like three to eight units, but, um, every single one of those properties has been, you know, mismanaged old, um, hasn't been touched in 20 years because that's where you can really find the gold mines in real estate. I feel like that's where you can actually grow, build equity fast. And then, you know, 10 through one exchange buy the next one and keep going. Because if you're buying a property, that's let's say 30% below market and you're buying a property for 700, it's worth a million dollars if it's brand new. You put in a hundred grand, you just made $200,000, right? After, you know, costs and commissions, it's a little less, but um, that's my strategy. I'm trying to find distressed properties that's in multifamily and then fix them up and refinance them or 1031 exchange into a bigger asset. So that's kind of been my strategy so far. And there's a buyer for both. There's a buyer that wants the done product, like a doctor or something. It's like, they don't have time. They just want to put their money to work, go do brain, do their brain surgery and collect well, a check. Let's be honest that's hard work. Like to go in and, you know, I mean, you know, cause you're actually doing the, the, the management of these projects, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not easy work for sure. I mean, you're dealing with, oh man, uh, contractors, you're dealing with, um, tenants, tenants, <laughs> tenants is the big one. Yeah. yeah. Tenants is the big one. Um, you gotta be very careful. They got to massage the entire process. You can't be, you got to kill them with kindness. You got to do it right. Um, you can't ever get frustrated no matter how frustrating it gets, but yeah, I mean, it's not just like, I'm going to buy a property for this much and sell for this much. It's a huge process that goes into it. It's the acquisition, it's the financing, it's the construction, it's, you know, budget. it's the budget, vacating the units yeah, vacating the units. It's the simple math that you have to make sure it's correct or else you're going to not make money. So a lot goes into it. So if you're someone who's making let's say $2 million a year with your job, let's say you're a killer plastic surgeon or something. I mean, that's probably not the path for you because it's a huge time consuming thing to do. And if you're making, you know, really good money, then just park money into a turnkey product, let it cash flow a little bit, and then just keep growing your portfolio from there. Cause San Diego rents are never going to stop growing. It's just a fact, no matter how little, maybe it's 2% a year, maybe it's, you know, 6% a year like this year, which is crazy. But, um, your property is going to go up in value no matter what in San Diego, I feel like in the long run. So there's a buyer for both. Like you said, it's a buyer for everything. Yeah. And I think like, I think too, is just like learning the basics. It's like, if you take San Diego, we, you know, the four walls, but also is people that move to San Diego. A lot of people that when I talk to people, I go, Oh, you're buying a home. Yeah. Let me guess the story is you came to college here and then you're like, I don't want to leave. And then you got a job and then you fell in love and then you got married and now you're pregnant and you want to buy a house. How'd you guess? I'm like, I don't know. Cause that's how it is. But I'm guessing that you've been here for eight years and you rented exactly. Cause I couldn't afford to buy until I got to ching the job or saved or a lot of my people are buying younger parents are giving them money. So we're in a place, we're in a renter's nation now, but we're also, this is more of renting because people can't, the, you can't afford it. I mean, the entry level to buy. I mean, I, I don't know if you can get a condo for less than like 400. I mean, I'm yeah. literally telling you, I would say 40 and 25 to 40. If I had to guess like if I, people buying homes, 
60, 70 percent, maybe more. I mean, I don't even know, are getting money from their family to buy. Some get wow. a shit ton of money. Some get just enough because they're like, there is no way. And a lot of people now, you know, at first it was like, you know, a lot of real estate, don't buy, it's dumb. But then you're like, okay, don't buy. But you do realize like you said, over the next 10 years, rents are going up because the income's going up. It's going to get, it, rents are going up big time. For sure. It's, it's crazy, you know? And it's like, so I think people are really thinking like, my gosh, like, I'm going to, should I get locked in or am I going to get in 10 years? Rent's going to be a lot. I mean, if you're paying 1500 bucks in 10 years, you're not paying 1500 bucks. There is no way, right? What What's your current <laughs> philosophy on renting versus buying in terms of like where you live? Oh, we could do a whole podcast on this topic. You mean <laughs> the owner? Know, you I mean, love to talk about it. So <laughs> you mean the owner? Are? Yeah. Okay. No, no. Just like renting versus owning. Yeah. Um, first off, I think buying a single family home is the biggest scam in America. If I, I mean, Okay, let me rephrase that. If you are buying a single family home for your first ever property that you're buying, I think it is the dumbest thing you can do because you are buying an expense, right? You're buying a home that you just spent a ton of money, you know, saving up for. You put down two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars in this house if you're in San Diego, and you have a mortgage every month. I mean, it's you're losing money every single month, and you just put down three hundred thousand dollars in that house. Whereas if you buy like a two to four unit or um, maybe even FHA, if it qualifies, you're putting three and a half percent to 20% down on a property and you can maybe live there for free or you can cash flow it if it makes sense. So I think that's a huge concept that most people just don't understand that is the reason why they get stuck. Because if you buy a single family home and you spend your life savings on it, I mean, it is just the worst thing you can do in my opinion. Um, I still rent and I'm going to rent for a long time until I have a lot of cash flow. So I know that's what you do too. And you, yeah. you agree with that like hundred yeah. um, percent. But I think someone should rent as long as possible and build up their portfolio, whether it's a portfolio of just stocks or a portfolio of just real estate to where the dividend income or the, or the passive income can support the mortgage of your future house. So that's my take on that. The hard thing for me too, is because we have multiple friends in this boat and some of them are in their forties. Even it's not like they're in their twenties or their thirties is so like you said, you saved up all this money and now you want to buy a house. So you put the money down on the house and the house was probably a little more than you wanted to spend on your mortgage because let's face it, you fell in love with something that was a little outside of your budget. It's like the same story every time. So then, <laughs> so then. Yeah, it doesn't change. Yeah. So, that was spot on, yeah. Yeah, so then. Wait, we didn't even get to the remodeling part right, when you closed on the it's house. Like, you, you don't get it. Now you want to redo the house and you want to decorate the house and you want to do all these things. So it's not just the mortgage anymore and the taxes and the insurance. But now you're saying, okay, well then I, I should be investing, you know? Okay, we're going to start on that. But every time it's like, well, we got to redo that kitchen. So after the kitchen, then we'll start. Oh, after the kids' uh, private school, we'll, we'll get to it. After the I new car, get to buy a car, the whatever. Yeah. So then you wake up one day and you're 50 years old and you haven't even invested any money because every single dollar goes towards this house that you love and you want to take care of, but you never ever get started. Like it's this weight that's, that's carrying you. And then you're already sold on this idea too of owning a home. So now you don't want to go back and rent. Like that would just be taking a step backwards. Right. So this is the conversation that we even have with some of our friends. And at the, this point, some of them are, have even like thrown their hands in the air and they're like, yeah, that was probably dumb, but I'm just, uh, I'm not going to do it. And I'm like, you have choices. <laughs> It's just crazy. I mean, I love your guys' story of how you had like a killer single family home in Mission Hills, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you ended up trading that into eventually a 30 unit building after making a few trades. But yeah. now you have a ton of, you have 30 tenants paying you rent every month yeah. from that house you sold. Yep. Um, so I love that story, but um, I think it's just crazy how some people can just fall in love with a house and never get started on buying multifamily. Well, and I think they feel like they're giving up that dream too to sell the house and to move to a rental because we suggest it all the time. It's a very unpopular opinion. Like um, very. When we talk to people, they're like, yeah, but then it's like we never hear from them again. And then, you know, I think it's like a, a little bit of a shame that happens. But the thing for us too is that's really hard because Kenny, I do want a house. Like eventually, of course, we have kids and it's kind of like I would love to have a home. And he says to me the other day, Crystal, I'd love to see you take our cash and put most of it down on a house that you're going to redo. And then you don't have any money to go buy an apartment building or three this year. And I'd love to see you do that. And it's like, you're right. 
right? Because now you get to the point where I said, you're like, no, I told her, I said, go, go buy a house. No, go do it. No, go. you look at go the down- wire the money. She, she, you would, you would wake up and be like, give me the money back. I made a mistake. I know her. So the thing is, is that once you make the change, I the the, the hardest thing is taking that first step every time. Like you know, the first step to to buying an apartment building or an investment property, whatever. It's hard because it's scary. scary. It's scary. But then after you do it a couple of times, then you start looking at your money in a very different way. You're like, hmm, I have $300,000 to invest in something. I could make probably a, two grand a month, three grand a month. And then you're like, hmm, I don't want to buy a house because that's going to cost me like three grand a month. So now every time we have, that's kind of like our hump to get over is like we went the opposite direction. Now how do I convince myself that buying a house makes sense because that's money off the table that I could have had got cash flow, flow from. It's so just when you're willing to yeah. deploy and you don't care about it. You know, you're at that level of cash flow. Right. I think the problem is, is like on this topic is, is that I tell, I literally say this over and over like all day. I feel like I need to just record it and just play it for people. You know, your conversation when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 changes. And I always tell people like literally all these clients, I love it because they're six years old. They do a refi. They're talking about retirement. They go, oh, tell me about that. They go, yeah, boy, I'm looking at my retirement going, where did I go wrong? I go, what do you mean? They're like, I should have just had more. I mean, yeah, I mean, because I'm looking at their finances. They're like, we start talking about retirement. We get into conversations. I go, what do you mean? They're like, you know, Kenny, I was making good money in my 30s. And then, you know, you have your kids. And then, you know, you want the nice car, the nice house, and your nice vacations and private school. And now I'm 60. And all I did is I just contributed to my 401k and this. And this is what I have. I have my house and I have that. I was supposed to get around to buying that investment property or investing more money. I just never did because we always wanted the new car, the new, you know, that's what they wanted. So, it's like, Chris, it's very easy to go down this path and look back and you're like, what the hell did I just do? It's also very easy to be like, just rent, invest all your money, and then in 20 years, look back and be like, where am I? It'd be a completely different place. No, I agree 100%. I think <clears throat> the most important thing to investing or one of the most important things is just living below your means, right? Because if you don't live below your means, you're not going to have any extra cash to invest. And I feel like, when you're making a lot of money, like the ego just gets to people's head Ooh. and they have to have like this beautiful luxury house on the beach. They have to have, you know, the fancy cars. They have to have their, you know, kids in private school. And it's that it's the ego that kind of takes all them. it is. Yeah, it's the ego. I mean, if you just didn't care about what anyone thought about you and just lived in a decent condo that you rented maybe and, you know, went on nice vacations. I mean, I'm a huge believer of having experiences yeah. over material things. For sure. Like, I don't care about the fancy watch or the fancy car. I care about like, you know, going on, you know, trips and experiencing culture. Yeah. Um, so I just think if you just do that, I mean, you save a little bit of money to go on, you know, vacations, live below your means and buy real estate. Like if you do that for 20 years, you'll be set forever, you know? But people just don't understand that. It's just... It's just it. It's just. It's mindset. not sexy. It, but it's really also, not. But, it's not. It's boring as hell. Yeah. But yeah, we also boring. live in a world that's you're brainwashed, complete opposite. Like every day, it's in your buy, 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 buy. The government doesn't want that. It doesn't work for the government. Well, I think it's all habits too. So, yeah, like, exactly, you're starting. You started really young. We've started. It's like now your habit is not to think like I need to buy this house or I need this fancy thing. Now your habit is, okay, I, I'm, I, my money is to invest. Like I work, like that's how we are too. I want my, our money that we make at, from our businesses to be just to invest in real estate. I want my real estate to cover my lifestyle. That's how we live. So if my real estate doesn't cover my lifestyle, then I don't increase my lifestyle. Like that's just the bottom, that's it, the bottom line. Income is straight to investing. It's amazing. Yeah, I was, I was like, uh, I was writing a bunch of, quotes down for Monty over there for our social because she needs them. <laughs> but one of them I came up with, it was true. I just thought about it because I do loans and I, unfortunately I see people just, wow, like, boy, like Chris and I always say, like, I was talking to somebody last night. She's like, you know, Kenny, I grew up in Tijuana and she's like, you just wake up and you're not stressed because everything's paid for. You don't buy unless you pay cash. So you move to America and you get a car payment and a house payment and you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, we got to make, pay these payments and she goes this is crazy how and then you see other people like 
stretch. You're like, how do they like the stress and this? And so we don't feel that. We just are like so far away from that reality. Like I don't even want to go back there. If I had Crystal too, she had to go back there. She'd have a panic attack like times a thousand. That's what would panic her. And so I'm like writing quotes, but I'm like, yeah, to me, I'm like, if you're not saving 40% of your income, how the hell do you have a thousand dollar car payment? How do you have a $2,000 car payment? Like, yeah, what are you had doing? Yeah, we a $2,000 car payment and she could barely yeah, get Yeah, I'm dealing with it right now. So it's embarrassing her. She's in, when I asked her, I asked, do you have a credit card or a car? Uh, I'm like, uh-oh, this isn't good. She goes, no, it's not. I go, what is it? I'm like, whoa. She's like, yeah, there was the Tesla. I was like, could you sell it? She's like, well, or I'm like, it's such a sore subject. It's like, so that's what we're talking about. It's like, it really, this is all comes down to like, and Jason, that's what I said is you're successful at 24 years old. It's not like any of us are better than anybody else. It's like, you just wake up with a mindset that says, this is what I got to do. I don't have a choice. I don't have a tr- money tree. I don't have parents. I, don't, I, I It's me. It's me. Yeah. I'm really not better than anyone else. I mean, I have no special talents. I have no crazy like sales ability. I learned sales when I was 20 by my senior broker. Like I was never in sales before that. Um, so I just think it's all about mindset, like you said. And you know, it is tough. I mean, I drive a 2017 Ford Focus that I have no car payment on. And sometimes I see those Mercedes and BMWs in the road. I'm like, damn, I could afford that. But I know I got to keep buying real estate. But um, it's very easy to get caught up. Your mind gets caught up in the BS, you know, like, cause we're brainwashed when we were kids. I mean, when I was 12 years old, I was watching rap videos, YouTube videos <laughs> yeah. of people with the fancy cars, like flinging money around, yeah. right? Like since I was a little kid, I've seen And then your stuff. friends have nicer cars and you're like, yeah. man, I really should. Yeah. Yeah. Exa- exactly. It's and just- then you see the true life story of 50 Cent. What, he's broke? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're literally brainwashed since you're a kid to want fancy things. So it's tough. It's yeah. Tough. I like, you know, I really like Robert Kiyosaki because um, if his story is, you know. That's a, like a must read, I think, for everybody. No, but oh, his yeah. story was is rich dad, poor dad, but it's the mindset, right? And But it's like, he's like, we we him and Kim bought property and they started making 10 grand a month residual. And they're like, okay, we can buy a house. And he's like, even today, he's fine now, but he's like, the first Ferrari I wanted to buy, he's like, I wanted to buy, I wanted a Ferrari. And so he's like, okay, well, I got to go buy a piece of real estate that's going to pay me enough to pay for the payment. And like, you're sitting here going, man, it's like, okay. So you, that's why I always say goal is like, hey, Jason, you want a nice car? It's probably need the tax write off anyways. Like go buy, okay, my goal is buy the real estate that pays for the damn car. I mean, you would do that, but that's how people should think rather than like, Chris said, ah, I'll just do it later. I'll do it after this. I'll do it because everything comes in life, you know? So, um, So I want to transition into talking about um, anybody listening to this that's gotten into commercial brokerage or getting into sales or anything that's probably listening that's young. It's like maybe even their 30s and 40s and they're like, dude, I'm struggling. I'm not finding success. Like it's amazing how blockage can come at 25, 35, 45, 55. It doesn't have to be young, right? Like what is when you, there is like a, there's probably a transition point, right? Where you're like, all of a sudden I just hit it. What, like, what was it for you? Man, that's a good question. Um, I think 2020 out of all, you know, years, right, <laughs> was the year I exploded. And it was also the year where a lot of brokers kind of fell off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was because I was grinding so hard in 2019. I was making 150 calls a day. I was sending a ton of emails, cold emails, ton of postcards, ton of digital marketing campaigns. I was just hitting it hard. Nice. every single day in 2019. And I think those clients after just following up, I think following up is the most important thing in commercial real estate or any sales game. Um, the money's in the follow-up. And when I followed up these people in 2020, like a lot of their brokers like weren't calling them and like they gave me a shot to like find them a buyer or maybe list their property. And from there, like my business has just exploded. But it's really hard to like spend time on something if you don't see the benefits right away, right? It's all about delayed gratification. And most people don't even know what that means. It's like, because we're in a world of instant gratification, right? We have our cell phones, we go on Instagram. Immediately you get that dopamine boost because you see the people's stories, all that stuff. So like our minds aren't trained to like work eight to 10 hours a day in an office, make zero money, go home, come back, make zero money, come back. And that was me for the first six months. 
So um, I think the transitioning point was when like all my hours like just turned into a bunch of listings that I came at once and a lot of escrows. And from there, like my business just went insane. Like right now in 2021, I've closed 24 transactions and I have 18 more in escrow and I have four listings. So it's just really blown up. And And you bought on average one property a month. Yeah, right around there. Yeah. So, I mean, I really, um, I mean, honestly, I'm not going to lie. Like I'll say, I, I think I'm doing a little too much right now. I think I'm like drinking out of a fire hose. I think I need to peel it back a little bit. And I think that's my issue that I need to work on for myself is like, you know, spending more time on, you know, exercising or doing yoga or, you know, doing stuff that benefits my, my mental health. Cause I think I'm just like so overloaded with stuff right now that I'm kind of just like, my mind just freaks out. That's like meditate every morning to like calm myself down. So, um, yeah, I think that to answer your question, the transitioning point was really when like the fruits of my labor, like came to life and I kind of just saw it happen. I just felt it like, like I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, it just clicked. Like I knew I was going to make it like when that moment happened, it wasn't like just like one moment. It was like when like business just kept coming and like, um, I just kept my foot on the gas pedal. And then from there, just 2021 has just been crazy. But a couple specifics. Yeah. So while you were working and making zero money for the first six months in brokerage, did you have a second job or like, what were you doing outside? What did that life look like every day for six months, not making any money? I love that question. Um, so actually I got my license in August of 2018. That was me going into my last year of college. So that was, so I was taking 15 units. I was running my digital marketing business, making money. And I was going in the office, making calls three days a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would just cold call every single day. Tuesday, Thursday, I had class. And then Saturday and Sunday, I would work on my marketing business. So um, that was insane. Like I was very depressed at that time. So um, my entire senior year, that was my schedule. And I didn't close a deal until, yeah, like six months in or something like that. But during that six month period when I didn't close a single deal, yeah, it was rough. I was freaking out a little bit. Um, I, I almost quit like three times. I was going to um, say, what got you through? Yeah, I almost quit. I mean, w- what got me through is literally I had a photo of my mom and dad on my phone and wow. I knew it was for them. So. You get goosebumps every time you yeah. talk about your parents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I do too. So, yeah. so it just I just wrote down every single day that I was going to make it and here we Jesus. are. Jesus. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's like, that's what people need to hear. Cause like, that's the problem is somebody sees you now. It's like, that's why I tell people don't ask about now, ask about how, you know, back then, you know, that's what, that's because what's... that's the biggest thing in brokerage. Like a lot of people, most people don't make it. They come in, they want to get in real estate cause they hear everybody's making money and doing really well. And they have this free schedule and then they come in and they realize that they have to beat the phones all day long and they're not going to get paid for a long time. They have to probably pay to get their own, to, to get their real estate license on top of it. You're literally paying to work. And how am I going to make it? And are you willing to work a second or even a third job just to pay your bills until you can? And most people just can't hack it. Like they don't do it. Yeah. I mean the six month, like before I closed my first deal, I barely made rent. Like I almost, I was completely broke. I had nothing. Um, and then I got my first paycheck, which was like $2,000. Cause like it was a super small property and I got like none of the cut, but that from there I closed like two more deals and then I was good. But I feel like until you get that first deal, it's just really, really tough. And people just don't understand that. Like they see me like on social media posting, like trying to, you know, put out content. They're like, oh, like, how do you do this? Like, it looks so easy. Like you're you're like closing all these deals. Like it it can't be that hard. Right. I'm like, you know, try working with me for like two months and see what you think. And I have four guys under me right now. And like, you know, they're seeing it because they reached out to me on social media. I hired them from there and you know, they're seeing it's a grind and it takes a lot of work to get there. And if you don't have the right mindset or the correct fundamentals it's just not going to happen i've seen people it's a revolving door i've seen like five six people at my old company just not make it um yeah, yeah no it's i'd say like 90 percent of people get into brokers just don't make it that's I mean, probably a correct stat yeah 90 yeah, yeah it's it's i mean what you've done is not just just the brokerage and then buying so i mean kudos to you for staying with it because that's the thing is i think uh for crystal and i is for some reason we never probably talk about it, but the one thing is us is we just know when shit gets tough, we just push through. 
and shit's gotten tough and we just literally just know how to push through the shit. Like, like I need a bigger bulldozer. Where would I find it? And I just keep going. I tell people eventually it, you get, when you push hard enough, you're going to get something. But sometimes you're like, okay, I've been pushing for a long time and this shit isn't, I'm not getting through it. And, and then right, right when it happens, that's that right. When you push you and you get that break, that's when it all changes. It's never like, well, going it's crazy because it. it's so difficult until one day it's just suddenly not, you know, you're like, it's so difficult. And then like the next day something happens and you're like, oh, okay, well, things are looking up, Yeah. but it's, it's really tough to kind of go through that. Cause I, I think like you said, we're so into instant gratification. In fact, it was really difficult for me to do any marketing. Cause I was like, what the hell is this? Like, I'm going to spend money and I don't even know, like, is it just going to be wasted? Like I literally looked at it as a waste. And so it was the wrong mindset. And now, you know, like it's taken some time to change it, but it's, it's the same thing. It's like taking that first step and you're like, Oh, okay. I get, well, I'm, well, I'm getting this thing. It's I, an investment. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. a podcast. Everybody's like, I've, Talked to enough podcasters, right? Like we interviewed Travis. I think he just came out. Super cool guy. That's what he does is teach people a podcast. And it's like, you know, we were talking about in the mastermind, like when somebody else asked me about it, like, hey, somebody said I should talk to you about uh, starting a podcast. I go, no, talk to Travis, not me. Like, I'm just not the guy. But it's like, everybody's like, it sounds cool and fun. I'm like, yeah. So it takes up your time. It costs money. And I mentioned it takes up your time and it costs money. And you might get nothing ever out of it. Oh. Why would I want to do that? Exactly. But that's literally like when Crystal's like, hey, we're doing this podcast six months, Kenny, like we're small time, money. Like we're not getting anything from it. Like this is like, and all of a sudden it was like, you know, you called us like, for, I think from watching it, right? I did. Yeah, I did. No, it just shows all of a sudden we started getting more people. What do you mean you want to come in? So obviously it does pay off, but that's why I told Crystal, give it a year. Don't even think about it. Just, we're going to spend the money, give it a year and this and that. I mean, Monty is even like, she's watching numbers. Like you change it, but Everybody just wants it now. So that's why podcasters, I forget what it is. Is it, what is it, mind see? Like 90% of them quit after the first 10 episodes or 95? Have you ever gone onto iTunes and looked at how many podcasts? Okay, so speaking of brokers who have never started podcasts, CBRE started a podcast like right at the beginning of COVID, I want to say, or maybe a little bit before that. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to subscribe to this podcast. Episode two came out and there has never been another episode since. <laughs> like, no, okay. no, but look, wow, look, Crystal, clever. even, I mean, I don't care if he hears this, it's knowledge. Even Michael Becker did. Yeah. He's like, great. He hasn't shot one in a while. I think you just get busy and you realize this takes time, money and energy. And so do you really want to do it? You know? And so we just made a decision to be consistent, but look, I get to come in here and talk to you. I know you, but then we have these great conversations and it gets out there. It's cool. It's all, it's great for all of us. I, there's a passion. You have to have a passion like this. You know, that's why you're probably doing this. I like to tell people like, we've got to talk, have this conversation. And when I go outside in the world and we see each other, we have a connection from it. Like it is, it's true. Exactly. Like, you know, it's like, um, so I don't know. I, I just think I, I was going to ask you with all those things you did, the calling, the postcards, the digital marketing, everything for anybody listening. What is your best? What was your, you look back, what's the best ROI for you? Honestly, um, for my business, I think it was number one was just the direct calls. And then number two was the postcards. I think digital marketing is more of a long game. I still do it and I've gotten some really good leads from it, but I just think it's our industry is so archaic that not many people are like accustomed to that yet. Um, but it's, it's just a long game. Like you said, it's a snowball effect, just like your podcast. Um, it just snowballs with every episodes. And the cool thing is it's, it's branding too. I mean, yeah. Branding is a huge part of business. And I feel like a lot of um, people in the real estate industry don't treat their career as a business. They treat it as a job. And that is the biggest difference between the people that are crushing it and the ones that you know don't make it. Which is crazy because I don't, we don't work with you because you're Keller Williams commercial. We work with you because you're Jason Lee. Like, that's real estate. We work with the person, not the company. So it's really interesting that so many people in our industry don't look at them as a personal, themselves as a personal brand. It's kind of insane. No, a lot of people are really it for is. their company and they put all this time and effort motion and then they go pivot somewhere else. And it's like, oh, what happened to so-and-so with this company? Now you're on your own and you forgot you built their brand, but not your brand, you know? And so... That's that's why I think being the entrepreneur, right? They call it under a brand or something is super smart. So, 
So what's, what's, what's next, Jay? What's the, uh, what's on the forecast? What do you, uh, I mean, what's your opinion on what are you seeing out there with buyers, sellers, the market? What's, what's your pulse, you know, in the market? Yeah, I think right now in the San Diego market, at least, I think there's more buyers than ever. <laughs> and I think there's less sellers than ever. So it's just creating this, you know, huge, um, price increase, right. Of every asset in San Diego. Um, I know it's the same with single family homes too, but even in multifamily, I mean, um, we were talking about this. There was a 96 unit that got listed in National City by Dave. And he said that property had like a ton of offers on it, a ton of interest. And that's a big building. Like there's not a lot of buyers for that kind of product. Um, yeah, but there's not a lot of that product in San Diego. Yeah. That's period. a great point. That's Ever. a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. That was like the first big listing I saw in San Diego. Like he saw a hundred unit building listed. <laughs> Especially yeah. there. Yeah. San Diego. Yeah. No. Yeah. We're a mom and pop. City, you, you see know, them in like maybe sure. Escondida or Vistas, but not there. Yeah, they it's don't come rare. up no. for sale very often. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, and they're usually not owned by a mom and pop owner either. It's usually some sort of institutional. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think the market is just a frenzy right now. I think rates are low; they're going to stay low. Um, you know, I think inflation really isn't bad at, bad as much people think it's going to be. It's really not. And I think all the economics are there. The fundamentals are there for. You know, if you buy right, you're going to do well in San Diego. So that's my take on it. And then you had Logan on your podcast too, right? I did. Isn't I did. he amazing? He is amazing. You, you got anybody He's, who's listening to this should go listen to that podcast. I feel like everything with Logan, like I just want to listen to everything he says. Cause yeah. And with yours, yeah. I mean, I found him through you guys. I just thought that podcast was so good with you. I was it like, was so good. I, I was like, I, I gotta so have him on my podcast. I know. I want to do more stuff with him all the time because I like he's bold, blunt. But also, you know. he's like very data driven, which no, is that's so what you want, not amazing. emotional. Like, let's let's look at the numbers here. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a huge problem too that we should talk about is so many people, like all the so many millennials, just think the market's gonna just explode and crash and burn. But there's no data to support that. Like, I got three DMs last week asking when is the market going to crash? Like I'm ready to buy. I was like, dude, you're going to be waiting a long time. I was like, just go listen to Crystal and Kenny's podcast with Logan. It'll, it'll tell you everything. But I was like, it's, it's just crazy how many people are waiting on the sidelines when they could be making money. So. I had a client randomly just pop in like right before you came here who said, Crystal, I really thought there was going to be like a huge flood of foreclosures come on, coming on the market. And I don't know. Do you think that's going to happen? And I'm like, in what world are you listen, living in? Listen to my monthly. It's like Logan would say, the trolls, like there's no, like but, trolls but out there. I'm doing you. a monthly webinar, Monty and I, and it's, the, I data, it's from this other source, so I do it. And it's so funny because I know you even have the information, Monty, but what they originally thought the foreclosure was at, they're off by, was it 50, it's like, they're way off, right? And I tell people, is it going to crash? I said, let's just look at the numbers. Okay. When it crashed last time, we gave, did you hear that? A heartbeat and pen loan. So anybody with a heartbeat and pen could get a loan. And when your cleaner had four rental properties, it's probably a problem. That was the truth. The big, sh the guy that wrote the big short or one of the other ones that shorted. Like 110%. No, that's what tipped him off. LTV he said, loans. Uh, one of the guys that shorted the market, I forgot who it was. I learned this through Tori Larson. He said, um, he said, Kenny asked me, he goes, how did you know? He goes, well, when my cleaner said, oh, I'm buying a house. He goes, I thought you already owned a house. Yeah, this is my third investment property. He said, how'd you do that? Oh, 100% finance. He goes, he literally said, walked in his office, started making calls, said, this thing is going to implode. How do we short this? And they started figuring it out. So 2007, eight, there's 3.7 million properties nationally on the market. Today, there's 1.5. And no, it's no, no, not no. That easy to get a so loan. I tell people, you worry about foreclosures? Okay, cool. If the foreclosures hit and you had a million properties come on the market right now, you have a lot of buyers. You have to have it, money and you have to have decent no, credit to get a loan. It would right still be a million plus under what we had. They're really not building. The rates are historical low and the loans we're writing, the we're underwriting are pretty damn good. The only really subprime loans, let's be honest, probably FHA crappier credit when COVID hit FHA and VA were probably the worst performing. But if people do a little bit of research, I think instead of basically going like, Hmm, it's been about 10 years. It's time for another recession. Is the market going to crash? Ooh, COVID. And you're like, okay, well I have to look at data too. Like 
how, what kind of loans are being written? Where is the market at? How many properties are on the market? Like all this kind of stuff that nobody's paying attention to. They're just basically saying, regurgitating information that they heard from other places, which is every seven to 10 years where we have a recession. That's historically happened. But it's not like, that. that's not the end all be all, especially if the fundamentals are here to stay. Exactly. For a strong and the other thing is, is let's keep in mind, forget the government, but there has never been this much money in circulation in the private sector and us human beings. Like I tell somebody, I'm part of a mastermind and you know, this mastermind, all these people have a lot of money, some more than others. And then their friends have a lot of money and their friends, friends. So I'm like, I sit here and think about that. And I hear the stories like, oh yeah, I live in Utah and I meet up with 50 tech guys and they all had exits and they're all sitting there your age to 35, picking their nose with 100 million in the bank, 50 million in the bank, 30 million in the bank, 20 million in the bank, everything's paid for. They're like, I'm bored. What can I invest in? And I'm like, they're like, is it going to crash or this? So if things crash, there's so much money in the sidelines to scoop it up to push it back up. There's just so much money now. Like, they're, like even Grant, I was like to him, five years, he said, the last five years till now, for some reason, everybody's like, let's go buy income producing properties that give cash flow. So well, it's probably partially because Grant Cardone puts out so much content about buying income producing properties. <laughs> I think that's probably yeah. No, a lot For of people sure, is. No, 100%. No. People got educated. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. yeah. Jason, what do you think about people that don't like California to invest in? It's not landlord friendly and the politics and everything's going to hell in a handbasket. What do you say to the people who feel that way? I just point to my most successful clients and I say they're still buying in San Diego. They're still buying in LA. They're buying in Orange County. Um, and all the fundamental, all the fundamentals for growth is here, right? Um, like, for example, let's say you buy a property in Texas, right? In Irving, perfect example. I had a client who bought a property in Dallas and he sold his eight unit here and bought a 16 unit there. The cap rate was exactly the same his return did not go up at all. And I'm pretty sure that the rent growth in San Diego will be better here than Dallas because Dallas, they can build for miles and miles and miles. Everywhere you look, you're like, yeah, I can build anywhere I want. Exactly. So yeah. the rent compression just isn't there here. It's like, we're not building and there's no. people, people always moving here. So the economic fundamentals for a great portfolio growth is in San Diego um, in California in general. I mean, yes, it's annoying dealing with the the government and the and the municipalities, but if you really boil it down, you can always find a way to make money in this market. Like always, like I'm doing it right now. You're doing it right now, right? So like, and my clients are doing it right now. Like my client just bought a 24 unit in PB, did a cash for keys, got all the tenants out within two weeks, and rent and then rehab the property in two months, and he leased the property at a crazy rent in under 30 days. And now his property went up in value by over one and a half million dollars. Can't do that many places. You can't do that in many places. No, no chance. And so many, and I remember when that deal first came out, so many people were scared of getting the tenants out because they were paying so, so little rent that, and it was the pandemic. And this one buyer is one of my clients, you know, just had the, the courage to do it. And he made a killing because he understands how to maneuver the market. So that's my answer. And to also that. like, he's not scared to probably roll up his sleeves and do the work that other people aren't willing to do. Yeah. It's like, you know, I think, you know, for these deals, cause like you were talking about and the stage of growth that we're all in is like, at least us at the table is like, you know, we kind of have to take a little more risk and do a lot more work because that's how you grow organically too. Like I can't just, I don't want to just rely on my own income every year to try and buy something. I also want to organically grow through increasing value in my properties, refining, pulling cash out, trading up into something bigger. Like that's the way a lot of the big guys here that we know and have all, all look up to and look to as mentors, that's how they got to where they're at. So it's like, you kind of have to, to do the dirty work to get the reward. Exactly. It's just well said. I mean, I think no matter what, if you're not willing to roll your sleeves up and put the time into something, it's just not going to happen. And I feel like real estate is the most reward for the time you put into it. And it's fun. I mean, it's like you said, it's a game and it's a lot of fun doing it. It gets addicting. Honestly, I'm pretty addicted right now to investing in real estate. And I think it's just so much fun because you're building something, right? You're building a portfolio. I love building things. I love building a business. I love building a real estate portfolio. It's just fun. And I just think if people aren't want to put the time in, you're not going to, you're going to get left behind. 
it, I see pictures of or on your stories too. Sometimes like you on the weekends or like in the evenings, like you and your girlfriend going and like checking out some of your rehabs and stuff like that. <laughs> and I love it because Kenny and I used to be that way, like pre children. That would be like our idea. Our friends would be like, "Hey, we're getting together, want to hang out?" We're like, "Nope, we got to go to Home Depot. I got to go drive by this property. We got to like figure this whole thing out." And it is fun. Like, it's addicting. Like, I would rather do that than go sit around with my friends and drink and talk about nothing. I mean, no offense, <laughs> but it's just... I mean, no, you, I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's not an insult. I mean, it's just the reality, yeah. I would have said the exact same thing. I mean, there's no point in going to a club, getting drunk, having service-level conversations, and then going home, waking up hungover. It's not how I want to live. Yeah, and then we're, you can't we, wake up at three thirty in the morning living like that either. So that's no, that's but, a problem. But Kenny's also kind of a psycho. So <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, uh, let's just be honest there. Um, yeah, I would. And it's funny because we've kind of been out of the game because we had kids back to back, and we're starting to get back into it. And for us, it's like it's it's like it's like exciting again, you know. And I know like Crystal's like, okay, here we go again, and that's why we're hitting like stuff and all flat. And I'm kind of like, okay. You know, I'm excited to get one, just get back into it because, you know, we probably, when you met us, we were doing this stuff, we were probably like coming down from, we were probably like, okay, we're coming down because we were like, okay, we were hitting it way too hard. And everybody's like, we need to slow down because we're like, okay, you can't have kids. You can't work a hundred hours a week. You can't do this. So we came down in this and it's like, now we're coming back out of it. And it's like, you know, we're not going to work a hundred hours a week, but we're, I think we're in a different place now. We're like, we can start investing at a rapid pace and go at it again. You know, well, there's also the next phase I think too, which is like when you do start your family and our kids are getting older and they'll remember these times that like we drug them around the properties and we like, we're in there like, why are mom and dad doing all this stuff? Like, <laughs> but they remember this stuff and it's like a good education. Cause you don't get this stuff in school. You don't get it in college even like you don't get it anywhere. So to even just have these habits to like pass on to your family. Like I look at all that as good, not like, Oh gee, Kenny and I are working too much and whatever. It's like, no, like this is part of our family and they're going to pick up these habits along the way. Yeah. I mean, there will never, there will never be a college class that says multifamily value at investing 101. <laughs> like, That'll it's, never it's, exist yeah. in the history of the world. Right. It would yeah. probably tell you that's definitely a risky investment. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't do it. Like, yeah. don't do it. Yeah. Just get a W2, just live, put buy money bonds house. or something. Yeah. Buy bonds, know? put yeah. money into your IRA and you're good. Yeah. And spend all your money and get in your I remember I had that class in, in school. It was like, if you put X amount of dollars into your 401k every month, then you'll have a million dollars by the time you retire at 60 or 65. Like, and wow, I'm like, that's real exciting. What does a million, you it could did. not live out the rest of your it life. Did. In the eighties, it was a lot yeah. in the nineties, but not anymore. Not anymore. Jason, where, uh, so where is the best place people can find you, learn more about you, check out your podcast? Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was a blast. Yeah. Um, so people can just find me on my Instagram. It's just my first middle and last name, Jason Joseph Lee. That's the best place to find me. If you want to reach out to me, send me a DM. If you want to connect, that's the best place to find me. So thanks for having me on you guys. Yeah. I loved, honestly, Jason, I just loved having you on too, just because I've been saying it. Like I've literally had random people call me that got your postcards or your letters. I even got a letter from you. <laughs> um, and they're like, who is this guy? And I'm like, you need to be working with him. He is like on it. He is so talented and successful. And I love like your why and why you're doing things and how you support your you know family and how you want to do great things. Like I'm just really inspired by your story. And I love like seeing everything that you're doing. Thank you. It means Thank a you. lot. Yeah. Thank you. So before you go, you know, our final question, what is your definition of generational wealth? My definition of generational wealth is passing down something that's real to your kids and creating a real legacy that people, when you're long, long gone, can still benefit from and leaving something of value to your loved ones. That's my version of generational wealth. I love it. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for coming on, Jay. Thank you so much for having me. All right.